said useful, but uh, you don't hear all of it because it'd take a while. And uh, A, and B, this is not a lecture. What this is, is a sermon. And a sermon is an exercise where you're trying to find the place where your life and God's word intersect. And so the question always is, as I'm reading something, if this is my life or our lives together, where, how does God's word intersect at this point? Where does God's intersect in, my, intersect in my life? This passage is rather unique, though, because Paul does so much in such a very short space of verses. It's not an exception that he does this. Paul, when Paul closes up a letter, he tends to go all over the place and cover a whole bunch of topics really quickly. If you look at like 2 Corinthians 13, at the end of that letter, he writes, Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace be with you all. That's, that's one of his shortest conclusions. But I mean, he hits a whole bunch of topics all within this bam, 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 bam. And so... What this reminds me of, if I, read, I read the ending of all of Paul's letters this week. And, and if you read them, each of them back to back to back, after a while, what I started thinking of is, you know how when you're leaving for a while, you're, you're taken off, and you're leaving someone behind, whether it's, it's your mom and you're going off having graduated and you're leaving for the first time, or whether it's a spouse and you're going on a long journey, or, or whoever it is. You know those, those last minutes when you're walking out the door and, and the, per, the loved one is saying, you know, call me when you get there, make sure you don't speed, uh, and depending upon your age, you start hearing things like, make sure to eat a good breakfast and always wear clean underwear. I mean, there's one of these, these li line of things that you get told, and there's really no theme that's obvious. It's just a whole bunch of things that they're worried about when they're worrying about it at you, and you're just trying to get out the door and it's hey and don't forget to and yes mom and then you drive away that's what it feels like when you get to the end of one of Paul's letters he's just throwing all the things he's worried at about at them all at once and so uh, I gotta confess I've never preached the ending of one of Paul's letters because I always look at the, them and I say well what's the one thing how does this intersect with one place in our lives and I look at all the various things Paul covers all at once and think He's all over the place. I have no clue what... No, I should, this, this is a bad idea to preach this. Well, I, we're going to preach all Thessalonians this month. We, you have now read the entire letter. We've read the entire letter in worship together. And, and this is... We're going to take a look at this. And, and it's no more or no less the Word of God than any other part of Scripture. So we're going to take a look at it. Though I should tell you up front that... Uh, Whereas your usual sermon is one, it's like one big fat roast, one big topic that you can kind of chew on, this, this is not going to be like that. This is more like chicken wings, a bunch of little bites back to back to back. Hopefully they'll end up, they'll stack up to be a meal. So, but we're just going to follow along and see what Paul has to say to us today. He writes at the beginning, we appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you, who have charge of you in the Lord and admonished you. Esteem them highly in love because of their work. Talking about leaders in the church, right? And leadership in the church has always been kind of an interesting thing because to be a leader in the church has nothing to do with your status, your reputation, your background. It, it all has to do with who serves. A leader in the church is someone who serves. The words, e even the statuses, even the leadership positions we have in the church, all of them are words for service. Deacon is Greek for service. Uh, elder is the word for someone who is uh, experienced or older and elderly in service. Minister is Latin for subordinate or servant. Pastor is Latin for, for shepherd. All of the words, every status that there is in the church, they're all foreign language. They're either Greek or Latin for some form of servant. They just sound high flute, and they really all just mean servant, right? And so, you read what Paul has to say here, and it, it, I think he's pointing out pretty clearly that uh, we we follow Jesus, who said, "I came to serve, not to be served," and that in that spirit, if you ever look around and say, "You know what? I'm frustrated with how the church is going," well, then it's time to serve. And if you want to make a difference. Become a leader. And by what Paul's definition of that is, that means to get up and to serve in some way. Service comes first. Then you're acknowledged to be a leader the more that you serve. Paul continues, says, Be at peace amongst yourselves. Having just talked about leaders, I think it's clear here that uh, 
It is part of what we lead towards is peace, something we work towards as a community. This peace all being both the practice of forgiveness and the practice of reconciliation, practices that we never really finish learning. We're always getting better at. We're always, uh, you know, this reading this this week, it, it struck me that uh, if peace is broken down into forgiveness and reconciliation, I'm pretty good at forgiving. I'm committed to re reconciling, but I still have a lot to learn about that. This is a practice that we have a ch as a church are always learning more at, being at peace amongst ourselves. He continues, we urge you, beloved, to admonish idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. You ever get reminded to take the trash out? You know you got to take the trash out. It's trash day. It's on your schedule to take the trash out, and you're going to take the trash out. But still, even that morning, someone reminds you, hey, Andy, take the trash out. And sometimes I do it, and sometimes I don't. The point being, what Paul's doing here, he has talked about admonishing the idlers, encouraging the faint-hearted help. He's, he's talked about that in the letter we talked about the last weeks, but you know he just can't help but say it one more time. Hey, remember that thing we've been, remember to do that. This is Paul saying, take the trash out. He, he has reminded them left and right about this, and he's, he's saying it one more time, just for good measure. He continues, See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. This is one of Paul's themes he returns to again and again and again, that when evil is done to us, we do not repay evil for evil, and instead we repay evil for good, which we're not often tempted to repay evil by like actually physically hurting someone, but by what we say, we really can return evil for evil. What we say is what, where we usually get in trouble here. But Paul uh, is talking about this. He says... And he's saying this to a church that has caught flack. This is a church, if you remember, that's catching flack from those around it because they're so weird now because they're, they're following Jesus. And why are you all so weird? And he's saying to them, always seek to do good to one another. It's not sometimes stumble into doing good. It's not inconsistently contemplate doing good. It's always seek to do good. That's quite a bit higher of a standard there. Then he gets into the, what, what I think of as the verbs of faith. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. And, and this is the way that Paul's reminding them that faith is something we receive and then we practice. We rejoice always, even when we're not feeling joyful. We can still rejoice, get together to pray and to sing. We pray consistently, we give thanks in all circumstances, even if we're not giving thanks for all circumstances. I can give thanks to God for salvation, even even if I'm not happy about the circumstances I'm in at that moment. Give thanks in, but not for all circumstances. Paul continues, do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good. This is kind of an odd section because we really don't know what he's getting at. We don't know, is there a problem about uh, quenching the spirit? We don't know what the situation is, but uh, I think the best we can make of that is to say that however you hear God in, in, in study of scripture and prayer and worship, however it is you hear God when you pay attention and, uh, and listen and don't assume that everything you hear is of God, test it against the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. He then starts to wrap up saying, May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit and soul and body keep sound and blameless the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do this. His whole letter has been a letter about sanctification, the process of becoming more Christ-like. That his, He's been going back over their history saying, here's how we have, you started becoming more like Christ, so keep on doing it to become more like Christ. And he is teaching them, even when he teaches them something new, something about the second coming of Christ, that it comes in a thief of the night, he then says, now, you're not going to know it's coming, so relax, let's get back to following Jesus and being sanctified day by day. And so Paul reminds him here at, this, at the end that, that this is all capable because of the one who calls you is faithful and you can stand blameless. You can be sanctified. He asks, Beloved, pray for us just as we pray for those who we love. Greet all brothers and sisters with a holy kiss because that was how you... The holy kiss. You hear about the holy kiss in scripture on occasion. And, and the holy kiss then is like what we do with a handshake now. You, you give someone a handshake when you're starting a, a relationship. You handshake because you're saying goodbye. You give someone a handshake because you're, you're in the, creating peace. or I mean, you use a handshake all the time. 
And what they did back then is they did the kiss. And uh, the only place we still do the holy kiss of peace is at the end of the wedding. Right? At the end of the wedding, you may kiss the bride. That is the kiss of peace. That's not the kiss of anything else. Uh, but So if we wanted to be consistent in the way that we've ditched the holy kiss and instead do handshakes, the, the really consistent way to do this would be to say you may now shake hands with the bride. But, uh, yeah, not going to try that anytime soon. But uh, that, that's what he's talking about, this way that we use handshakes to, to build up relationships. And he ends saying, I solemnly command you by the Lord that this letter be read to all of them. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. If you think about how we sign off on letters today, what do we usually write? Uh, I write grace and peace or something like that, or sincerely, uh, gratefully yours or something like that. The way that you signed off on letters then was to write, be strong. That's what the common way to sign off was. You'd say, be strong. That's not what Paul writes here. He does not tell people to lean on their strength, but instead reminds them that we lean on God's strength. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. If we don't lean on our own strength, we lean on what God offers us. And that's it. That's the letter. You have now read an entire letter in worship. And as I said about... Uh, a sermon, right? A sermon is a place where you're looking for your life and God's word and where they intersect. It, it may be that in all of these various things that Paul seems to be like randomly grabbing and pulling in, maybe one of them really clicks for you. And, you know, the idea about leadership or practicing the faith as praying and rejoicing and giving thanks. Or, or maybe the idea that it's not that you need to be strong but lean on God. There are many different things Paul covers and maybe one of them intersects with your life and, and you're glad and, and you needed to hear that. Because otherwise, this is just kind of a random collection of thoughts, and it's just really random. I do have an intense need to try to find, be able to wrap a bow on it and try to pull it all together and make some sense of it, other than just Paul worrying at people. And so, here's the best I can do. It may be that what Paul is doing here is not randomly worrying about a whole bunch of things at the last second. What it may be that Paul is doing here is that he is not trying to just randomly worry about a whole bunch of things, but instead what he's doing is trying to show the comprehensive way in which God cares about every single aspect of our lives. In the way that what Paul says intersects here and here and here and here and here and all the different parts of our lives, what Paul is showing us is that there is no part of our life which God's word does not intersect. There's no part of our life over which Jesus being Lord does not impact. There's no part of our life that is so messed up or so far from God that it cannot be sanctified. Maybe Paul isn't being totally random today. Maybe what Paul is trying to do is to show us that when we submit our lives to Jesus, it is all of our lives, and that as all of our lives are, are, are continually submitted to Jesus, every part of our life can be transformed. Amen.